The Intellectual and Artistic Renaissance. The objectives are, one, discuss humanism, the most important intellectual movement associated with the Renaissance, and two, identify the great artists and sculptors produced by the Renaissance, such as Michelangelo, Raphael, and Leonardo da Vinci. Now first, beginning with humanism in general and the Renaissance in general, really the major theme of Renaissance is secularism. Secularism and an emphasis on the individual characterized the heart of Renaissance. That is, that they began to see the world through a non-religious gaze and began to see it through a uh, worldly focus, not in a sinful sense, but a, a, a worldly humanistic sort of um, gaze and looked at it through the eyes of the individual person and the individual character. And so this, this key um, element really forms the intellectual movement of the Renaissance known as humanism. Humanism was based on the study of the classics, the literary works of ancient Greece and Rome, and a return to that emphasis not only in art, but also the conception behind the art, the gaze or perspective, the worldview of the Greco-Romans. Now, there are several leaders of this movement, Erasmus for one, whom was the, uh, the figure on the last slide, but Petrarch is really the father of Italian Renaissance humanism. And he um, focused on the individual and individualism in the 14th century. And his work emphasized a return to the classical uh, conception, the classical gaze, the classical ideal, and used and emphasized a pure classical Latin. He emphasized a return to the true ancient Latin, not the medieval corruption that emerged within the Catholic Church Latin. Um, because uh, over time, the Catholic Church had manipulated and changed and altered the Latin, um, sometimes intentionally, sometimes just through natural linguistic evolution. But nevertheless, Petrarch uh, called for a return to that ancient classical Latin and to read the classical literature that existed uh, through that language. Now, humanists rejected, um, in general, family and a life of action, um, not as um, a general principle, but rather as the focus, and uh, emphasized a return to a classical ideal of learning, um, not through the religious gaze of family and, and a life of action toward works of mercy and and behavior, but rather a contemplation, reflection, deep thought. Now, one of the other trends intellectually that is emerging uh, during this Renaissance period is vernacular literature. That is, that some writers began to emerge that wanted to use the vernacular languages of their regional um, life rather than the classical a medieval sort of linguistic tradition, using Latin primarily. And so in Germany, of course, they would want to use German, which we'll see with the writing of the Bible um, by a particular heretical group. Um, we'll see this in um, several other literary uh, genres, which is really what we want to focus on here. So in the 14th century, we see this major shift occurring, um, which is, again, part and parcel to the return of that Greco-Roman tradition. So in the 14th century, literary works really uh, transformed, particularly one of the prime examples is the Italian author Dante, as here depicted. Um, also, you have works by the English author Geoffrey Chaucer and the French woman Christine de Pizan. Now, all of these um, figures in history um, wrote these very important literary works that we can take a look at a little bit, but have a long tradition shifting away, not only um, from the Latin to the vernacular, but shifting sort of the, the content or ideal. So first off is the Divine Comedy, which was written by Dante. 
Now, the most famous, of, of course, of the Divine Comedy is the Inferno. Um, you also have Perdicio and Purgatorio, which are, of course, create a kind of trinity in which Dante is guided through hell, um, through purgatory, and into heaven. And really is a social commentary um, more than a religious um, kind of novel. Um, yes, religion is the backdrop and the theme, but what he is most famous for and why this is really important is, um, yes, it was written in Italian, but the concept that he melds or uh, brings up um, Greco-Roman mythology and, and um, uh, various gods and monsters of Greek myth in his work, which is really part of that Renaissance movement or the return to these uh, Greco-Roman traditions and myths and, and, and cultures. Um, and another work that um, does not do the same is uh, Geoffrey Chaucer, um, an Englishman who is writing the Canterbury Tales, which is an incomplete work, but emphasizes the uh, the return of several people to um, on on a um, pilgrimage to the Canterbury uh, Cathedral, and they're entertaining each other by telling each other stories as they go. Now, what's fascinating about this is not only is it written in English, a uh, an old form of English, but English nonetheless. But what is fascinating here is the very earthiness, uh, the terrestrial kind of tone of the writing, uh, very comedic and funny and uh, very earthy, as it were, very much um, a work that would interest the peasant as well as the elite. Um, and finally, uh, the Book of the City of Ladies, the famous French um, approach to writing vernacular literature. Now, education in the Renaissance really was characterized by this movement of humanism as well. The humanist movement had um, a dramatic effect on universities um, and the kinds of approaches and ideals toward education. So at the core of this shift was uh, the, hum the humanist schools um, really was a shift toward the liberal studies. Um, now, according to the humanist, students should study history, moral philosophy, eloquence, letters, poetry, mathematics, astronomy, music, which is a huge shift away from what was the emphasis in, in the medieval period. The medieval period had focused on kind of the key areas of what they, they saw value in. Um, that is, namely, medicine, law, and theology. Those are really the, the three key areas that, um, that medieval education emphasized because that really had to do with the functions of church and monarchy. But here we see an expansion of education to benefit the individual, to focus on the individual. History um, for exemplars of moral character, uh, moral philosophy in general, um, guidance for the individual, eloquence in terms of speech, um, which would uh, largely be important for a nobleman to become noble um, through refining their character. Um, letters and poetry, um, being eloquent and being able to uh, express one's emotions and feelings. And then, of course, mathematics, astronomy, and music, which will be um, a, a huge part of architecture and expression of, of the, the human soul through music and art. So, in general, we see a major shift occurring um, through these approaches. Now, of course, following the Greek ideal of the sound mind and body principle. Humanist educators also stressed physical education, that um, in the classical Greco-Roman mind, uh, he, one needed to be both physically fit and mentally fit. And so this really became the, the kind of uh, rallying of physical education in the first kind of early on stages of ed education during the Renaissance. And its aim was not to uh, create necessarily great scholars, but complete citizens, which is a key ideal. It's not about creating the greatest lawyer to function for the monarch in the kingdom, but rather to create a educated, 
um, citizen who would be able to um, be informed and benefit society in general. And uh, so we begin to see this, these concepts crop up all over of Europe, but particularly in Italy first. Now, in general, we see a massive shift in art, um, which, which really um, connects and builds off of the humanist approach. So um, the Renaissance art in Italy really began with a focus on nature and on humanity. So Renaissance artists sought to imitate nature in their works, and no greater effort than in the human body. Um, these are sketches from uh, Leonardo da Vinci. And, of course, you can see the process of trying to understand the human body, the human structure, the human muscle system, bones. Um, all of this is important, not only just for medicine, but, but in terms of art. How does one depict the human body in proper form? in terms of reality. And so they wanted onlookers to see the reality of the objects or events they were portraying, rather than some kind of spiritual ideal or some glamorized, idealized form. No, they wanted the reality to capture the human experience and the human condition in a true sense through art. We also see new techniques emerge, particularly in painting. Um, in Italy, we see uh, the development of frescoes, that is, painting done on fresh, wet plaster with water-based paints. Now, of course, in terms of duration and length and preservation, this becomes problematic um, through cracking and things like that. But really, as a, as a new shift and trend, as we begin to see walls and ceilings uh, painted in this new fashion, so by mastering the laws of perspective primarily, and which enabled uh, artists to create the illusion of three dimensions, um, they began to approach painting in a realistic fashion, in a realistic form, um, by looking at perspective. Now here you can see on this uh, fresco, while Jesus is looming large overhead, you can see the people looming down below him, proportionally smaller because of height, but maybe not necessarily because of his uh, spiritual girth, as tends to be the case in medieval art. Medieval art painted the spiritual size of a person and not the physical size of a person. So Jesus would be uh, huge in a medieval painting and the sinner tiny in the, uh, below him because they were painting the spiritual size of the person. But here this becomes the, the new focus, the new technique. Um, and really the perspective not of God, but of humanity. Uh, we also see this, this sort of shift in sculpture and architecture in general as well. Um, in general principle, we see a revitalization of Roman and Greco-Roman uh, sculpture and realism. Um, so we see also cathedrals um, emerging away from the Gothic and into new forms as well. Um, but one can see even here in this in this uh, statue the attempt at creating a true muscular system of a true body. Um, and while the the subject matter is mythical, um, it's it's Laocon and um, being cursed um, he and his children um, and being bit by snakes. Um, is, is really about the human figure. You can see uh, the detail of trying to capture the true human body. And by the, the end of the 15th century, Italian painters, sculptures, and architects had really created a new artistic world that really reflected um, grandeur, yes, but true human um, character and true human um, quality and true human figure. And so... This really becomes kind of the core drive of those that came after at the High Renaissance. Now, the High Renaissance emerged somewhere between 1490 and 1520. And these are characterized by Leonardo da Vinci, Raphael, and Michelangelo. Now, Leonardo mastered the art of realistic painting, and it was Leonardo's goal to create idealized forms that would capture the perfection of nature and the individual. Of course, Leonardo's uh, most famous painting is the Mona Lisa, 
um, which is lauded as a beautiful depiction of um, the perfect sort of capturing of woman, um, which is, is fascinating um, that that is the ideal. But, but the idea is to try to bottle or capture through, um, through art, painting, um, the, the real perspective of humans and, and the interactions of humans in life. Another example would be Raphael um, and his painting of the Vatican Palace. Um, the most famous, of course, is the School of Athens. Here depicted the central piece, which is uh, Socrates and, uh, and Aristotle, um, both of which are really focusing on the, um, their philosophies. And in the whole painting, all those around, all philosophers surround um, these two great philosophers. Um, you'll notice that uh, Socrates, Plato, is pointing upward, emphasizing his primary theory of the forms. That is, the true reality is um, that which is beyond. Whereas Aristotle focuses on the terrestrial, and notice his hand is placed down toward the earth, a focus on the physical, on the body, on the earth, on those things that are observed. Now, um, Michelangelo's figures on the on the Sistine um, on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in Rome um, also reveal the ideal type of human beings with um, with perfect proportions. So, for example, the creation of Adam by God, um, which is a famous um, scene where the two fingers touch together. But you will notice in that painting um, idealized portions of, of proportions of a human. Now, this. Renaissance migrated and moved from Italy um, and did not remain confined there, but moved to the north. So in the north, we um, typically saw Gothic cathedrals, and in Gothic cathedrals, we um, end up seeing massive um, stained glass windows during the medieval period. So there's there's no real frescoes um, because there's no walls by which to, um, to put plaster and paint on. And so what ends up becoming the trend is uh, wooden panels for altar pieces. And artists would paint elaborate and impressive um, paintings that would go over these wooden panels at the altar piece. Um, now, of course, um, this goes beyond just religious themes and goes into the very earthy, very natural themes as well. Um, and so the most important northern school of art in the 15th century was found in Flanders. And this can really be uh, characterized and, and um, emblem, emblematic of this movement, um, particularly by Jean van Eyck. Um, Jean van Eyck's oil painting primarily. Um, and oil painting really becomes the kind of standard in the north. Now here, of course, the, his most famous painting is Giovanni um, and his bride. Um, very... Um, focused on the human condition. Here, seeing he and his, his new bride um, in their private bedroom chambers um, with their dog and their shoes on the floor. and uh, Very, very human. Very uh, concerned with the individual and the individual perspective. What's fascinating, too, though, is in the back, um, there is a, a mirror. And on that mirror, you can see the backside of these two and also the one who has walked in this room to greet them which is uh, a characterized um, by really a detailed approach at trying to show the human experience um, it, it leads the viewer of the painting to place themselves inside the painting to say that they are the one who has come to meet these people and you can see your own reflection in the mirror in the back um, and so we, we see very again very much so a a, uh, a earth laden topic a very earth focused human focused gaze rather than the divine now of course another northern artist is the german artist um, who was very uh, influenced by the italians was albrecht Dürer. And his most famous work was the Adoration of the Magi, here depicted. And uh, Durer did not reject the use of uh, minute details. Um, he favored minute details, um, which, of course, really becomes characteristic of, of the northern 
artists. They uh, like to focus on the the specifics and the specific details, which makes them uh, much more dense and rich, um, wh- rather than some of the um, streamlined attempts um, that you begin to see in Italy. Um, streamlined, human-focused, that are um, not not simple in the sense of of being not um, technically advanced, but um, focused. Whereas we see in the north uh, very much more busy paintings. And so Albrecht's attempt to, to talk about um, the adoration of the Magi really has a lot of subject matter and a lot of detail. Now, ob- our objectives to this general kind of look at the intellectual and artistic uh, Renaissance movement was, one, discuss humanism, the most important intellectual movement associated with the Renaissance, and then two, identify the great artists and sculptors uh, produced by the Renaissance, such as Michelangelo, Raphael, and Leonardo da Vinci.